And welcome back to Canada Tonight. Well, in the spotlight tonight, legendary Canadian businesswoman and TV personality Arlene Dickinson. You might know her from several seasons of Dragon's Den, a role backed by decades of experience helping businesses go from early stage startups to multi-billion dollar corporations. And Arlene Dickinson joins me now in studio. So good to see you. I've been very excited about doing this interview because I've watched you for a long time. We've never met. Uh, and I've been, you know, eagerly awaiting this moment. So, you know, I know that people in this country, uh, people that watch Dragon's Den around the world know you as this very successful businesswoman. Uh, but they might not know that your roots go back to South Africa. So talk to me a little bit about growing up there and when you made the journey over here to Canada. So immigrant story, we left when I was three years old. So I didn't really grow up there, but I was yeah. born there and we came over um, very, very poor. The typical story of an immigrant family coming to the country with absolutely nothing and just kind of setting out to make our way in, in here. And my dad really wanted to bring us somewhere where we had opportunity and working hard would actually get you a reward and you could put food on the table and roof over your head. and. It was, uh, it, was, it was really quite interesting. I mean, as, as little kids, I can tell you, we didn't have anything that was winter. Like, if it, <laughs> if it had, like, a winterized view right, of it, yeah, yeah, like, yeah. no winter coats. We had silk scars for, like, <laughs> like, when it was cold out, we didn't have anything that was... Not prepared for no, the Canadian winter. No, not prepared for Canadian winter. And, and I, I heard a story that... Uh, you, you had to actually sell, uh, your dad had to sell a, a, yeah. what, the wedding ring? Yeah, my Is dad right? had to sell my mom's wedding ring. When, when we came here, we were really, as I said, we were genuinely broke. We had like $50 literally to our names. Yeah. And uh, our car broke down. We had a used car, it broke down. And my dad ended up trading in my mom's wedding ring for another used car because it's all we had that was any value. And it do you was, remember that? I sure do. I was six years old when it happened. And I, I remember it. Like, like I can remember the memory of all of it. Now, some of that will have been amplified by our family talking about the sure. situation. But yeah. I absolutely remember sitting in the car when it happened and kind of my mom crying when she gave him the ring and my dad feeling horrible that he had to do it. And the sacrifice that immigrant families make, you know, to make sure their families and their kids can, you know, be successful in a new land. It's not easy. And you don't know anybody, you yeah. don't know anything about the culture, you don't have any friends to rely on or family to rely on. I think it's very difficult. Yeah, my parents, I mean, my parents came from Trinidad, yeah. uh, you know, warm Trinidad to Calgary, Alberta in the middle of the winter. Um, so, yeah, I mean, immigrant parents make so many sacrifices. D do you remember how that moment kind of affected you long term? Yeah, I mean, I, I probably couldn't have articulated it back then mm -hmm. the way I can today yeah. because, as I said, we've talked about it as yeah. a family. But what I saw was, this, as I said, the sacrifice. And I also really started to see the kind of the dysfunction between my parents and the, my marriage, yeah, my parents' marriage breaking down. My mom didn't want to come to Canada. She was a sixth generation South African. It was mm -hmm. all so different for her. And so what I remember is feeling like something monumental was happening in our lives and that, you know, the, the plates were shifting and we needed to kind of pay attention to everything around us. And I do remember thinking about, you know, I get asked a lot, did I ever go back to try and find that diamond ring from my mom? And yeah. I, you know, I, listen, I didn't have enough money to go even try to find it until I was quite a bit older in life. So I never have done that. But it made me realize that, you know, physical possessions aren't important. What mm. matters is what we will do for our families and, and kind of the lengths we'll go to to make sure that they're safe and secure and, and can survive. Thinking back to your, your childhood, what do you think, uh, you know, the experiences were that made you so driven? That's, uh, you know, I, I, wish, I, I, I wish I had a really good answer to that because I often think to myself, why do I do what I do? Like, yeah. what makes me, I've got a resilience, I have a love for life, I was taught to be very grateful and generous. Like, these kind of core values were really implanted in me very young, but I... I never feel like it's enough. I always wanna I, I always wanna make sure I'm getting the most out of life. Yeah. And so I think I just wanna leave something. And I, I wanna leave a legacy. I wanna make sure that I've done something meaningful. And so I'm driven to driven to do something. And yeah. I, I still am trying to figure out what that something might actually end up being. Well, you have ambition, obviously. Uh, I, I mean, you know, what are kind of the, the values that underpin that though, and what that legacy will be? Well, it's resilience. 
Yeah. Like you have to be able to get up every day in spite of all the challenges, especially for entrepreneurs. I mean, this is a really tough economy. This is really hard. You have to be resilient. You have to be persistent. You can't quit when things get tough. You have to be able to keep going. Um, you have to have a sense of self-worth, which, you know, as a female entrepreneur was very difficult for me to find. And um, you, I, I think you just have to believe that there is, that your voice counts for something. Mm -hmm. And in a world where everybody wants you to pick sides and, you know, not talk too much about what you really believe because you might sure. stand out, I think one of the things that I have found through my life is that by speaking out, you actually, and being vulnerable, you actually help yourself be stronger. And how did you get there? Because were, were you always there or did it, did it take a while to learn that lesson that, you know what, I, I am going to say what I want, whether there be consequences or not? Uh, it took me a long, long time. Yeah. It took me until much later in life. And I still, listen, I would be lying if I didn't say that I still get intimidated. And I still sometimes feel like I can't say exactly what I feel because people might, you know, um, not listen to me or I won't be heard. And so you push yourself out there all the time. And, or other, if you don't do that, you go home and wish that you had. Right. Right. And that, that sense of why didn't I say something like is really overwhelming for me, so yeah. I'd rather just say it and get it over with, but it wasn't until I was older, Travis. Like, hmm. I didn't have, I was, I'm still not as confident as I would appear to really? be. Really? No, no, really? no, no, That's really. shocking to me. I know, no, I'm, I'm very insecure. But I'm insecure about myself personally. I'm not right. insecure about myself professionally. It's a very big dichotomy. I mean, you might, right? Do you understand that? <laughs> I right? totally understand right? that. Right? Like yeah, I do. I know what I know professionally. Yeah, I'm very sure. clear on that. It's your comfort zone, right? Yeah, yeah it's my comfort totally. zone. But personally, I don't want to really talk about me too much. I, right? I hear you. I think a lot of public people are like that, actually. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, Talk to me a little bit about being uh, a single parent and kind of the juggling act that you had to do at that point in your journey. You know, I had, I was a uh, young, my kids were, um, had joint custody with my ex-husband. Yeah. Four young kids under, you know, they were young, um, no money. It was put food on the table, put a roof over their heads or not. Like there was no option. So people always say to me, well, how did you manage four young kids on your own? And I go like, there wasn't a check this box, yeah. here's an option, you don't have to do it. There was, I had to do it. And sometimes I think that necessity and that, you know, like there isn't anybody, there's no safety net, you have to do it. And so I got up every day to do what I had to do, which, you know, sometimes I was good at and sometimes I wasn't. Fast forward now, Dragon's Den, how did that whole thing come about? Got a call from CBC one day at my desk and saying, hey, your name's come up on a list of female entrepreneurs and we'd like you to audition. And I, I mean, I was, I'm in marketing at yeah. the time and still am in marketing. And I thought, I don't want to be on television. Like, I know what you guys do to TV personalities. <laughs> I don't want to do that. Yeah. And, I, and I said no. And then they, I, they auditioned and ended up having a fight with uh, Kevin O'Leary in the audition because he was uh, there kind of just seeing if there was a chemistry test right. with the audition. Your friends now, right? What's that? You're friends now with him? <laughs> no, I would, I would not say friends with Kevin. No, I don't think so. Um, but but you know, part of it was rooted, and we kind of disagreed right from the very beginning. You know, yeah. and, and ultimately they asked me to do the show, and I went home and my, I said to my kids like they've asked me to do the yeah. show, and they said, Mom, you're going to do it, and I went, Absolutely not. I don't want to be on TV. And they said, Why not? And I said, Well, I don't want people to judge me for my looks or my weight or my appearance. Huh. Like, I was so consumed with feeling like people would judge me. Uh -huh. And my kids looked at me, and I remember this is season two. My kids looked at me and said, Mom, what are you worried about anyhow? Who watches that show anyway? So <laughs> at the time, I thought, all right, nobody's going to really see me, so I'll do it. <laughs> and, and that was uh, 15 years ago? That was, uh, no, um, 18 years ago. 18 and, years ago, yeah, okay. This is season 19, and so I was on season two, so it was right. being taped. You, you left for a period, and now two you've come years. back. Yeah. Tell me uh, why you left, and then, you know, when you came back, why, why, why that happened? So the, the show called me and asked me if I would come back. And yeah. I had taken two years off because I wanted to build a fund to invest in the food and health space. And I thought, you know, maybe this is the right time for yeah. me to do that. And I wanted to step away. And I kind of thought maybe I've done what I needed to do on the show. And um, two years built the fund. And then they called me and said, would you come back? And I thought, absolutely. I, I had so missed this 
intimacy with Canadians and l hearing their dreams and understanding their passions and hearing about the innovation, which fueled me, you know, just listening to people's desires and having them yeah. come on and talk about what they wanted to do with their lives. Sure. It, it was so compelling. And so they asked me if I'd come back after two seasons and I said yes. And I've been now back for, I guess this will be my fifth season back. So when you are sitting there and you have these, you know, folks that come through, I see the atrium sometimes in this building packed with people mm -hmm. and, and they've got a dream, right? And you know it's their dream. It, sometimes the business case might not be completely correct, but do, do, does some of it go to like your gut instinct about the individual? Yeah, I mean, I think intuition, heart, head, these are the three things that you have to apply when you're listening to a pitch. Yeah. You want to you wanna think that you can... The person's being genuine and authentic. You want to think they're being honest. You want to think they understand how to build a business. So you have to measure all of it. And I can tell you, every time I've said on the show, there's something wrong here, I have been right. Uh, and I, I like that, I can, I can go back across, you know, now all the seasons I've been on, which will be 16 this, this season. And there have been times where it sounded really good, yeah. but there was something that was off. And it was in the body language, it was in the words, it was in the framing of the idea. There was always something that told me no, this, and uh, inevitably I was right. And so have you always had that intuition or is it something that, uh, you know, uh, you have learned through uh, experience in the business world? I've always had the intuition. I've just learned to listen to it more. So I've always had it, but I used to just dismiss it thinking that was just emotional, you know, EQ talking to me, yeah. but EQ is so important in business. So yeah, I've learned to listen to it. More. Absolutely. Uh, you, you know, you mentioned that you, you, you left to, to work in kind of the, the health space. Talk to me a bit about some of the work that you're doing in, in that area. I love investing in the food and health space. I, I mean, I grew up without money, anything, yeah. as I said. Food was not something that just every week we went to the grocery store and got food. It was when we could afford to get food, we got food. And, uh, and that wasn't that frequently. And so food was, I had a lot of, I have a lot of connection with food. Yeah. And I wanted to support companies. I'd see all these companies come on Dragon's and with great food ideas. And people would say, oh, you're gonna get squashed by big guys. And I kept thinking, no, like we have the best ingredients in the world in Canada. Why can't we support commercialization of these products mm -hmm. here? And so I've been investing in them through my fund, District Ventures Capital. Right. And, uh, and it's really important to me. F food security and food insecurity in our country is 58% is of the food that we make in Canada goes to waste. Yet we have huge food insecurity issues. One in six people do not have food security. So think about that. We've got all this food being wasted and all these Canadians who don't have access to food. If we can solve that problem, we will have done a lot of good in our country. So this is something that's important to me as an aspect of the investment in the space, right. is how do we make a difference. And, and so what are some of the solutions when it comes to this? Uh, you know what, like food banks were created um, at a time when uh, during the war when they actually had a very big need for food banks. Yeah. Food banks need to be reinvented and Second Harvest is doing a great job of that. I'm an ambassador for Second Harvest. Right. Thinking about how we can take food that was going to landfills and make sure that it isn't wasted and is repurposed. Also thinking about giving people the dignity of being able to make their own living, giving, you know, I'm a, I'm a big believer in universal basic income. I think people should have the ability to have enough money to be able to buy the food they need. So there's lots of things we can do to make sure that people have the ability to put food on their table. Are, I, I mean, are you, I've seen the news footage, and I'm sure you have, of these massive lines at food banks, not only in this city, Toronto, where we are right now, but right across mm -hmm. the country. Uh, how concerned are you right now about this situation and it, it, it getting worse before it gets better? V very. Yeah. I mean, inflation. P uh, have you been to the grocery store lately? Oh, yeah. Like, it's so expensive to eat. If you have a family of four or five, you know, being able to afford groceries is, is, it shouldn't be that way. So I'm very worried about it getting worse and worse. It, food banks are getting busier and busier. People are, on a, are, are not able to contribute and give to the food banks the way they used to be able to do that. So it's hard to get, it's hard to buy, it's hard to live right now. And there's a lot of fear and anger out there as a result. We need to find solutions and those solutions are only going to be found when government and private 
sector businesses work together to find those solutions that are actually viable. Um, it can't just be, it's, it's not about charity to, for the sake of giving, it's about charity for the sake of building something that's a solution. Uh, I'm going to ask you uh, about the economy, uh, because I, I wonder where you think it is headed right now. These interest rates are still hitting people uh, in so many different ways. Uh, and, and as I said, you know, life is tough right now. So, so where do you think Canada will be here in the next year? I think it, you know, we're going to be struggling for the next year. I don't think we're going to see interest rates drop very quickly here at all. Um, you know, we are, we haven't declared it a recession, but for all intents and purposes, it is. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, you're seeing inflation there. People can't afford their mortgages. When their mortgages come up, they can't renew them. They can't afford electricity. They can't afford their fuel. I mean, you can't go on like that and not expect to have desperate people doing desperate things. Yeah. And so uh, I'm, I'm worried about our economy. I don't think we innovate enough in Canada. We're putting too many dollars. I mean, the numbers came out recently, you know, just the new job numbers. Sounds really good, but 87% of those new jobs are government jobs which means that we're not focused on innovation. Right. And if we're not focused on innovation, we're going to be in trouble as, a, as an economy. So many people look to you, so many small business owners, entrepreneurs look to you as a role model. Um, if it is tough for them right now, uh, what would your advice be? What would you say to them uh, about the situation that they're dealing with? Partly, I would say that I don't think you can be an entrepreneur unless you're optimistic, first of all. Yeah. So having that healthy dose of optimism really will help you get through this because that resilience point is the one I talked about earlier is really uh, very important. But I would say to not pay attention to the news to the point where it takes you away from what you were going to do because entrepreneurs want to drive forward, they want to dream, they want to build and sometimes you can get scared by what you're reading, what you're hearing and so you have to stay focused on the possibility, you have to be optimistic and not stupidly optimistic, yeah, of course, sure, of course. <laughs> you've got to be yeah. smart about it, um, but I, I'd say don't, uh, some of the best businesses in the world were started during recessionary periods. You have to be scrappy, during the recession, you have to be like really cash conscious and be able to build without having a lot of resources around you. Those are great skills for entrepreneurs to learn. Arlene Dickinson, thank you so much for coming. Yeah, in. my pleasure.